with you this morning. For those um, I don't know, my name is Paul Madison Gill, and I'm Redwoods pastor, and I'm the pastor and executive director of FIU NBC Wesley, which is a college student and young adult ministry here in Miami. Um, a number of faces are familiar to me, and I've, I've talked with several of you. Um, I actually, once upon a time, used to pastor um, at Raider. My wife, Amber, used to pastor at St. Paul's in North Miami. And as I was walking in this morning, um, somebody from that time period, I overheard them say that I looked older and tired. <laughs> and I, that's just the truth. I mean, I can't, I can't argue with that. Um, you know, it's, it's always good to hear and speak truth, right? And so, um, but no, it's a, it's a blessing to be with you. I'm going to make those of you, though, who knew us from back then feel older by, by telling you that Gabe is now... Five feet tall and over 100 pounds. He's, he's a 10-year-old playing competitive soccer. And so, um, anyway, but it is, it is good to see old friends and good to be with you this morning. So thanks for, thanks for having me. I want to share with you two scriptures this morning. The first is from Jeremiah 29, beginning with verse. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope, give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So that is great to hear. Um, and though I do not consider, despite what Becky said, I do not consider myself a young adult necessarily anymore. Um, but I do work with young adults. Again, I, I work day in and day out with a college and young adult ministry. And so people ask me what I do, and it's a little bit hard to describe. And so fortunately, one of my um, staff folks is really gifted with media and video. And so she's created a short video to kind of describe our ministry um, on campuses here in, in South Florida. And so if we can play that video. So no Who is Wesley? All we do is climb. Wesley is a community of students at Florida International University and Miami-Dade College striving to do three things. 
follow Jesus, love others, and change the world. We come from different countries, we have different denominations, and we hold different degrees. But the point is that we're in it together. Some of us have been on this journey a while, others are just beginning, and others are still questioning. But the point is that we're seeking. On campus you have a lot of other organizations and activities, but you don't really have on-campus like ministries that are so community based. They also teach you in ways that you wouldn't see things through. Like they give you perspective and since not everyone at FIU Wesley is the same age, it's different life experiences that I wouldn't get being my age and my background. So what does this community look like on college campuses across South Florida? It looks like meeting together on campus to worship in big groups, small groups, or one-on-one -on -one settings, diving into what the Bible says and how it applies to our lives. It looks like getting away on retreats and taking time to process who God is calling us to be and what God is calling us to do with our lives. It looks like living with others who are on the same path, learning how to love and serve each other in the daily rhythms of life. I think it's important for Wesley to be on college campuses because college is a time in young adults' lives when they're figuring out who they are, who their identity is, what they want to do with their lives, and it's important to search out who God is and grow in Christian community and just learn more about Jesus as you make those decisions. But it's about more than us. There are other students who need to know the Jesus we follow and the hope he gives. So we invite others into our community. We create opportunities to build relationships with students from all backgrounds. such as free lunches for international students, sports nights on campus, or open mic nights to express yourself. Have, you would have a difficult time connecting with people because you are in a different culture. But Wesley has provided me a real good platform which I can meet a lot of people. For example, their exchange lunches, their soccer night, their frisbee, their, they have all such games which actually make me meet a lot of people from different countries, different cultures, and I have learned a lot. And we know it's not just about our campus. There is a world crying out for justice. So we act, whether it's spending a week in Haiti, working on a grant project, or raising awareness about human trafficking, we look for opportunities to speak on behalf of the hurting and oppressed. Changing the world is setting people free from bondage and any type of bondage. Thinking about human trafficking. Going to Haiti will help for the children or the people who are going to receive the, the student in Haiti. It gives them a, a, hope, like a hope, something that someone do care about them. As a Christian, what am I doing? What's my role in this world? And I see my role as someone who is helping people and using social justice as a bridge to preach the gospel. So who is Wesley? I am Wesley. I'm Wesley. Yo soy Wesley. Yo soy Wesley. Soy Wesley. Yo soy Wesley. Soy Wesley. Wesley Wesley. Wesley Wesley. Wesley Wesley. Yo soy Wesley. Bush Wesley. I am Wesley. I am Wesley. I am Wesley. We are Wesley. We invite you to join us in what God is doing in our lives, on our campus, in our city, and in our world. We welcome you to Wesley.
is made possible by local United Methodist churches like you. It's your prayers and your <coughs> gifts um, through those things we call apportionments that make ministries like mine um, on campus, what are called extension ministries, make those ministries possible. And so thank you for that. The second thing I always say is that I know whenever I go anywhere in Miami that there are always people who are connected to FIU or Miami Dade, whether it's faculty, staff, or students, or you're related to a student, or whatever the case might be. And I would love to visit with you after the service and talk about um, if what you saw um, stirs something in you and, and would like to get connected, or somebody else you know you want to try and connect, we're happy to be happy to talk with you about that. Okay. All right, before we go any further, I want to invite you to pray. So let's pray. Lord God, we just give you thanks for this morning, the opportunity, Lord, to be in this place and to be in your word, to praise and to pray um, together. And I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide um, this message. Lord God, that the words of my mouth the meditations of everyone's hearts here will be pleasing and honoring to you. Uh, we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Well, as I said earlier, I'm excited to be here, particularly on Young Adult Sunday, um, and I'm excited that you have such a thing as Young Adult Sunday, because as somebody who works with young adults, it's really, really important that the Christian community be paying attention to and get involved with what's happening spiritually among young adults um, today and in our city. I was doing some research recently. And learned, and this surprised me, learned that there are 600,000, give or take, 18 to 34 year olds in Miami Dade County. 600,000. That, when you put it in perspective of all of the population of Florida, that means basically 2.5% of the entire population of the state of Florida is a young adult in Miami Dade County. Or basically one out of every 40 Floridians as a young adult in Miami-Dade County. And what that, and, and so that's a tremendous mission field and mission opportunity. Um, and so as a church that I've heard um, from Martin and others is really interested in finding ways to, to reach young adults and to be in ministry with and to young adults, um, I want to share some things with you this morning and just a, a few words from my experience the last few years. To kind of give you a picture of what that might look like. Okay? Um, and, but i got to start by asking you this question. Do you, do you really want to do this? Turn somebody and ask you, do you really want it? Turn somebody around and ask you, do you really want it? And, and, the, and the reason I ask is, you know, you know how when you're parents, I know parents know what I'm talking about. You know how when you're a parent and your child is like, oh, I really want this thing. And you're like, do you really Want that? Because I know what that means. And do you really want that? Are you sure? And that's kind of how I feel when I go to local churches and they ask me about the adult ministry and college ministry because it's not it's it's not an easy thing. And honestly, it's pretty hard, pretty messy at times. Um, and I just share a couple stories to kind of get into this. I was reading an article recently. And the article was from this Christian nonprofit, this Christian foundation. Basically, what they did is they went and they talked to a bunch of um, young atheists. The, ar the article was entitled, Listening to Young Atheists, Lessons for a Stronger Christianity. And so what they did is they interviewed college students who were part of what was called the Secular Student Alliance or Free Thought Societies on their campuses. So basically what that is, is, is like Wesley for people who don't believe in God. Okay, if you, get, if you get that, it's like a club for people that aren't believers. Okay, and so they interviewed the, this, you know, this group of college students from across the country connected to these clubs, and they simply asked them this, this question, tell us your journey to unbelief. Tell us how you got to the point where you don't believe in God. Okay. And so I'm going to share what, I'm going to share what they said. They, they compiled all these answers and they, they put them together. They pulled out themes. And this is what they said. They said that most of them had attended church at some point. 
before they came to unbelief. That most of them had attended church, but in their attendance at church, they found that the mission and the messages of the church were way too vague. They also felt churches offered superficial answers to life's difficult questions. Um, they did express respect for those ministers who took the Bible seriously. So I guess that's good news. But, and they also, the, the, the story showed that it was really high school, anybody working with youth, it's really high school 14 to 17, that those years were really, really decisive in terms of their faith development. Again, a message to churches about the importance of investing in that. Then, they also said the decision to embrace unbelief was often an emotional one. And what that means is that while the young adults, it, many oftentimes thought that they would be very logical and rational in rejecting their faith, that it was actually most of the time tied to something emotionally traumatic that had happened in their life, that they rejected belief. And then the final thing there is that the internet factored heavily factored heavily into their journey towards unbelief. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But the point is, is that if you're talking about being in ministry with and two young adults, they bring, they bring a lot of baggage with them. You see that? And it's not that, like a lot of this is, they've rejected church and rejected unbelief, specifically because they've experienced it and decided for a variety of reasons that it's not for them. It's almost like, you're, I'll tell you another story to illustrate, it's almost like, you know, I mentioned my two kids, Michael and Gabe, they're both competitive soccer players. And so you know how when you have teams, parents and grandparents, you have teams, you have like the end of the year swing party, do you know what I'm talking about? Right, the end of the year party of some kind, right? So, so we were having this end of the year party at my house a few weeks ago, and we were sitting there on the patio, and there were a bunch of parents sitting around, and these are parents that are involved with the soccer club and a couple of coaches, and a bunch of us sitting around. And then there's this group of teenagers sitting right there, older teenagers. And then the young kids were playing in the pool. And then so they, the parents are sitting around at the soccer party, and they're just going on and on complaining about the soccer club and complaining about X, Y, and Z coach and X, Y, and Z parents who have done X, Y, and Z things. And I, I kind of walked up into this as I've been down in the pool playing with little kids and had kind of walked up into this and kind of was listening. And then I looked at the teenagers' faces. And they're all kind of, you know, kind of rolling their eyes and kind of in their phones and kind of talking to one another. And, and I'm thinking to myself, so this, for the teenagers, this is, this is helping form their impression of the soccer club. Right? And I feel like a lot of young adults that that's a picture for their feelings about faith and about the church. They kind of heard and seen kind of the underside, if you know what I mean. And that has affected and shaped how they view the Christian faith and church. So again, I want to I go back to that question. Do, do, you, do you really want to get into this? Because, because it's challenging. But... It's really, really needed. Really needed. And so I want to share, again, just a, a few things this morning about, again, just some lessons that I would that I'd pass on that I've learned in working with college students. Um, but I want to start with the Jeremiah passage. The Jeremiah passage that we read a few minutes ago, it has this verse in it that everybody loves. Where's that verse? There it is. You know this verse? Read this verse with me. Ready? Go. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. All right, Jeremiah 29. Everybody, a lot of people know that verse. A lot of people love that verse. And I feel like it you know, talks about God has a very specific plan for my life, of, you know, a plan you know, for hope and a future. And I'm about to ruin that verse for you. Alright, sorry, but, but that's not really what the verse is about. Because if you were listening in the passage that we read moments ago, the, the situation is, is that the people are in exile. The people of God have been have experienced um, the judgments of a conquering army, and they have been sent, many of them have been sent into Babylon. And, to, and so they're living 
in this foreign land and they're away from their homes and they're away from all that they know and all that's comfortable and all that they've grown up in and they have a few people that are saying, oh, everything is okay, everything, and God is going to make things back just the way they were. And so Jeremiah steps into this, and he writes this letter, and he says, mm, no, those people that are telling you that are lying to you. They're saying, and he says that the world has fundamentally changed. And then he says, right before this verse, in verse 10, he says, you know, you know 70 years from now, God's going to restore God's, God's people. But that's 70 years from now. Right now, and, and this is what's wonderful about this passage. It says, right now, I want you to flourish where you are. Flourish in the reality that you're in. Seek, it says in verse 7, it says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. In other words, you know, Jeremiah is saying, stop longing for what used to be and for what ain't coming back and embrace the realities that you're in and flourish there. The world has changed. God is doing something different. Flourish. I feel like in a lot of churches I go that, that, I, that I go to, there are a lot of church people who feel like they and the church are in exile. They're in this really strange world that's completely different and they often don't understand it. And you know what? You're right. The world has changed pretty significantly. And the young adults that I work with and the young adults that you're talking about wanting to be ministry with, the world that they live in and has been, have been shaped by is very, very different than what most of us understand the world to be. I'm going to give you a simple example. So, you can tell me what that is? It's a smartphone. It's an iPhone 4S, to be specific. But yes, it is a smartphone. And many of you have these, I would imagine, or at least a cell phone that you carry around with you. And so, you know, Think about for a second all that you can do with this little piece of machine, right? It can, there are at least five or six ways that you can communicate with me on this phone. You can text me, you can Facebook me, you can email me, you can tweet me, you can an old-fashioned call me, right? Um, it's also, if I have a spare moment sitting anywhere, I've got games I can entertain myself or, in my case, entertain my kids, right? If, there's, if I'm lost, how do I find out where I'm going? Yeah. GPS, right? If I am trying to find something, if I have a question that I don't know the answer to, who do I ask? Google. Sirius or Google, right? All of that is possible on this little thing that I carry around my pocket. Okay, now, for those of us that are older than you know, 20, which is most of us, we look at this and it's like, oh, this is a convenient way that I can communicate. But somebody who has grown up with this, like the students that are coming into college, the very way that they understand what it means to communicate, what it means to form relationships and community, what it means to find out answers to your questions, has been shaped by this thing. Right? And so, we have to understand that. And so, when I'm trying to talk with young adults and students about what it means to communicate with God, prayer, this is the expectation that they have. It's like, I texted, emailed, called you, I even called you and left a message. And you didn't get back to me within 10 minutes. Are you angry? Are you ignoring me? Do you see what I'm saying? It shapes who we are and our expectations and how we see the world in some really fundamental ways. All right, so we could talk for a long time about different examples of this, but the point is, the point I'm making is that the world has changed significantly. And so much of what the church does and the way that we do it, it's not that young people necessarily judge it or think it's bad, it's just it, they just don't understand it. 
It's just so different from who they are and from, and from where, they, where they come from, where they, how they've been formed. So let, me, so let me share three things, very quickly, three things that I think are really important to try and give us a starting place to, to kind of bridge that divide that exists between the old, old world and the new, this new reality, okay? All right, three things that I think are really important. The first is this. You need to let them have doubts. Say that with me. Let them have doubts. We no longer live in a, in a world where people accept things because they are told them. And we have to create space for doubts and questions. Our young people are saturated incessantly with media. They are, they are connected through their phones and through the computers and all kinds of other things. And, and what that creates is that creates in a YouTube world where anybody who thinks they know something about anything can get on YouTube and it, all of a sudden it's authoritative because it's on YouTube and it's out on the internet. Which of course isn't true. My, my 10 year old likes to say 95% of the internet is lies. I'm not sure where he heard that and I'm not sure that's the right percentage. But, but we live in this world where you can't, anybody can say anything and make any claim they want to because of the technological means at their disposal. And it can be widely disseminated. And that's really confusing. That's really confusing. And young adults have been, have been brought up, they've been raised drinking the water of cultural relativism. And so we just have to understand that. We just have to understand that. And so they're also, as the, the blog things I was showing, the blog was also, they're deeply cynical about um, and, and, and suspicious of the church. But, and this is good news, but they're so interested and fascinated by spirituality. They're, they would call themselves spiritual but not religious. I don't know if you've heard that. But, and they also are really fascinated by Jesus. The, the guy Sharif in the video, the international student, he had grew up in India. He's a PhD student at FIU. He's connected to our ministry. I meet with him on a regular basis, and we, we're going to read the Gospel of John together this summer. And he is, he wouldn't call himself a Christian yet, but he would describe himself as a follower of Jesus. Because he has encountered Jesus in the Word through encouragement from friends around him, and he has read the stories and the teachings, and he's absolutely fascinated by who Jesus, by what Jesus teaches, and who Jesus claims to be. And so God is, 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 is drawing him in, and I can see it, and it's beautiful. But he had to have a place where he could come with lots of questions and lots of doubts. Not a place that simply says they have all the answers. We have to let we have to let them doubt. The second thing is we have to be deep. We have to be deep. Turn to somebody, turn to somebody next to you and say, you need to be deep. <laughs> Don't insult your neighbor. Just talk to them. <laughs> that you need to be deep. If you were paying attention a few minutes ago, and I know you were, on the seven things, two of them were that the mission and the message of the churches was vague. And then they felt churches offered superficial answers to life's difficult questions. What that means is that young adults reject cliche Christianity. They reject it. The, we, I preach when I, when I we do gatherings weekly on campus, and, and I usually teach in, in series. And one of the series I did this year that was really well received was called Six Things Jesus Never Said. Six things Jesus never said. And these are the six, just in case you're wondering. Everything happens for a reason. God has a specific plan for your life. God will never give you more than you can handle. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Just ask and God will give it to you. And God helps those who help themselves. Now Christians say this kind of stuff all the time. But that is cliche Christianity. Jesus never says these things. But these are the kinds of answers that we have grown accustomed to giving one another and that 
young adults who are very savvy about what they're being told, they recognize this for the shallow cliches that they are. And they reject it. Because there's way too much shallow in their lives already. When so much of who you are happens through a screen like this, or through a screen like this, you have to, there, there has to be, when things happen, there's, there's got to be a place, there's got to be people to whom you can go that will give you more than cliches, that will deeply invest in relationships and conversations that go beyond these things and get to the heart of really deep and difficult issues. Young adults are very socially aware. They recognize, they recognize how broken the world is in so many ways. But they don't know where to look, many of them, they don't know where to look for those deep relationships and deep conversations and deep people who will wrestle with them in a, in, a, in a more, in a deeper way about those important, relate, those important questions that they have in their lives. And we need to be deep with them. So we need to create space for their doubts, need to be deep. And the final thing we have to do is we have to do our faith. We have to do our faith. The passage from James, be doers of the word and not merely hearers, that's a sentiment that really resonates, really resonates with, with younger people. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they're like those who look at themselves in a mirror and look at themselves and not going away immediately forget what they're like. True faith, true religion, is pure and undefiled for the fathers is to care for orphans and widows, keep oneself unstained by the world. Not to deceive yourself by saying it, but not living it. And that really deeply resonates with young adults. You have to live your faith. They, they're, they're, young adults are really attracted to causes and convictions. To, to see somebody authentically living out something they believe, something that dramatically reshapes their life, really attract. And so what the church needs to get back to is embodying what it means to live out and practice our faith in our daily lives. Because they need to see authentic, passion-filled Conviction embodied, lived out in lives in the lives of the people around them. Not people that say certain things and go certain places, but then there's not really an effect on the rest of their life. We have to do our faith. And this, by the way, historically, this should be our strength as Methodists. Because Methodists historically are people that hold together personal piety and social transformation. God changes us so that we can be part of changing the world. That's supposed to be fundamentally who we are as Methodists. We have to do our faith. So I want to end by going back to the Jeremiah passage. There we go. Just have to point the finger. You don't actually have to push the button. Okay, so... Because I wrote this for you a minute ago, but there's actually really good news here. When we look at this, so, so God says to the people who are in exile, who are in this really strange land that they don't understand, He says that He's not going to abandon them. He's not going to abandon them. That God's mission will continue. That God does not change. That God's church will not fail. That we do have, we as the people of God, do have a future filled with hope and purpose. But it might be significantly different than our past. Because to reach new generations for 
Christ and to be in a ministry with young adults. It has to be on their terms. It has to be on their terms. And so, I'm just going to ask you again, do you really want to do that? And I hope the answer is yes. Because there are so many thousands and thousands of young adults in this city who need to know Christ. And need people and communities willing to be deep, willing to let them wrestle with their doubts, willing to live out faith, and willing to embrace all the messiness that comes with that. We need people willing to do that. So I hope and pray, and I'm excited for Fulford and the opportunity that you have to do that. I got a sneak peek of your new building. About a month ago, Mara took me over and walked me through it. I think there's great possibilities there for doing new and creative kinds of ministry. But it's, it's really messy. So I just want you to know that. Um, but it's wonderful. And so I encourage you to embrace it. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we see you thanks for who you are. Lord God, in spite who we are sometimes, Lord, that you never give up on us, that your love never fails, Lord, that you are faithful. And so, Lord God, I just pray for all of us that you would stir up in us a desire, Lord God, to live our faith more fully, to embody the love of Christ each and every day with those around us. Lord God, to let your love shape and change our lives. Lord God, I pray for this church and for its ministries. Pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit will just blow a fresh wind through this place, Lord God. Wind, um, Lord God, that, that reaches beyond the walls and into the community, Lord, where so many youth and young adults, Lord God, just desperately need people and communities to be deep and to be real and to be authentic. And so I pray, I pray for that, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you for all that you are. Lord, for all that you promised. Get to do our lives. We promise the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.